J.P. Morgan. The standard story of American business success is the story of rags to riches. This applies to people like John Rockefeller. It applied to Andrew Carnegie. It doesn't apply to J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan is a case of not rags to riches, but riches to more riches. He was born into a very wealthy family in 1837. J.P. Morgan may have been, by the time he died, the most powerful individual in American history not to have been a president. As we will see in the course of this lecture, J.P. Morgan had his finger on the pulse of the American economy. He had a control over the American economy that no individual, including American presidents, has ever had. J.P. Morgan became the greatest financier in American history at a time when American finance was taking center stage in American business and the American economy. In the course of these lectures, I've stressed during the 19th century, a transition from the mercantile capitalism, or that is the, the commercial capitalism of the early part of the century, to the industrial capitalism of the mid-19th century, and to the financial capitalism of the end of the 19th century. J.P. Morgan was the epitome of American finance capitalism. Now, in order to uh, explain the career of J.P. Morgan, I need to say something about banks in American history and their role in American business and the American economy. From uh, the colonial period in the early part of the American Republic, banks were vital both as institutions for depositing money, for lending money out, but also as the institutions that essentially operated the American money supply. In the late 18th and most of the 19th century, the predominant form of money in the American economy were bank notes. And these were notes they, they looked sort of like dollar bills, $10 bills, but they were issued by private banks. They weren't issued by the federal government. And these notes were issued as currency. There were, of course, coins that were coined by the U.S. government, by the, the U.S. Treasury and the Mint. And these provided coin money. But for the, the paper money that was most common in everyday transactions, individuals looked to private banks. Because there were so many private banks and because there were so many notes around, at various times in the course of American history, there were attempts to regularize the system, to create particular banks that had particular legitimacy or authority. Uh, there was a bank that was established in the 1790s called the Bank of the United States. This was by Alexander Hamilton when he was Secretary of the Treasury. There was a second version of the Bank of the United States that was established in 1816. In each case, this Bank of the United States had a, a favored position in the American economy. It was given special authority to issue banknotes, to accept the deposits of government funds, and to act well, in very much the way the modern Federal Reserve System acts. But both the First Bank of the United States and the Second Bank of the United States engendered suspicion on the part of very many ordinary people who believed that the banks were being operated for the benefit of the bankers and for the benefit of the wealthy classes. To some degree, this, this feeling uh, mirrored reality. The First Bank of the United States had been established by Alexander Hamilton for the purposes and profits of major investors, what Hamilton was trying to do was to ally the interests of major investors with the interests of the new federal government of the United States. The second bank of the United States became the object of the bitter enmity of Andrew Jackson and his supporters during the 1820s and 1830s. So that Jackson, in effect, waged his second presidential campaign of 1832 against the Bank of the United States. And in his second term, went out of his way to, as he put it, to kill the Bank of the United States. It wasn't entirely Jackson's doing. The Bank of the United States, this is the second version, was headed by a man named Nicholas Biddle, who absolutely scorned and despised Andrew Jackson and everything that he stood for, and distrusted the whole notion of democracy. So the political battle royal of the 1830s wasn't between Jackson and any of his opponents for president. It was really between Andrew Jackson and Nicholas Biddle, between the first president elected by the common people of the United States and the director of the Bank of the United States. Andrew Jackson won this battle. The second bank of the United States was allowed to lapse. And the result, this is something that Nicholas Biddle predicted, 
and sort of gloated over when it happened was the Panic of 1837. I talked about the Panic of 1837 in a few lectures ago. But in fact, one of the things that brought it on was the end of the Bank of the United States and Jackson's other measures to limit the, the power and the role of bankers. So through most of the 19th century, America had a love-hate relationship with banks and banking. The bankers were something that Americans wished they could do without because most Americans felt that these people had too much money and too much power, but banks were something they couldn't quite do without. Anyway, this is an important background to a lecture on J.P. Morgan because J.P. Morgan is going to turn out to be one of the most important financiers in American history and certainly the most important financier of the late 19th century in the United States. There's a second theme I need to develop here, one that I've alluded to earlier, and that is the rising role of stock markets. Uh, brief economics primer here. If you're going to start a business and you want to expand the business, there are two ways of raising the money to expand your business. One is to borrow money, and the other is to sell shares in the corporation. Uh, in economic terms, one is to take on debt, the other one is to sell equity. So if you borrow money, you have to go to a bank. And the bank will have certain restrictions, certain requirements. But you still own the company. You have an obligation to pay back your debt, but nonetheless, you still own the company. Banks, however, only lend money to companies that they think have a, a good chance of paying back the loans. Another way of getting the money that is, well, it's generally preferred by people who don't have either the collateral or the record to command loans from the banks is to sell shares of the ownership of the corporation. This is called equity, or commonly called stock. Until the middle part of the 19th century, bank loans were the most common form of generating uh, investment capital for business enterprises. But as the scale of enterprise increased in the mid-19th century, as railroads, for example, began to be developed, the investors, the, the organizers of the railroads, realized that they needed to get more money than they could get from banks. And so they turned to selling shares of the corporations. This required an institutionalization of the process of getting the money. Um, it, it wasn't brand new. People had sold shares of their enterprises, even in the days of uh, John Jacob Astor, for example. Individuals who were going to engage in trade with China would sell shares of their ships. People in the whaling industry typically sold shares of the ships. In fact, this is a very interesting example because ordinary sailors who signed on with whalers would be given a share of the profits. So they would be part owners in the whole enterprise. But in the mid-19th century, as the railroads and other big industrial enterprises uh, began to be developed, the sale and ownership of shares of stock became regularized. And it was concentrated in New York City, along Wall Street, and in the district that came to be known as Wall Street. It became an essential part of the American capitalist enterprise. And the activities of Wall Street, that is, of the finance capital, capital, if you want to put it that, the finance capital capital of the United States, became a major part of the American economy and a major focus of the interest in the American economy. Nowadays, for example, um, news reporting on American business always starts with what the Dow Jones average is doing, and people want to know what the stock market is up to. Well, this wasn't such a consistent concern during the mid-19th century, but it was coming to be viewed that way, and people could buy shares of stock simply for the purposes of seeing whether the stock would go up. In an earlier lecture, I talked about the battle for control of the Erie Railroad. Well, many of the people who were battling for control of the Erie Railroad had no particular interest in operating the railroad. They simply wanted to buy shares of stock as a speculation. They bought it thinking, hoping that it would rise in value. And if it did rise in value, then they would make money. They had no particular interest in running a railroad. They could care less whether it was a railroad or anything else. The question was, would it go up in value? Anyway, by the 1850s and 1860s, there were individuals who were coming to the fore in this business, and among those who were most adept were people like J.P. Morgan. Now, J.P. Morgan inherited an aptitude for the business. He inherited a sense for the business. His father 
had been a broker, a commodities broker. And as part of the commodity broking business, had begun to offer credit to his customers. People who engage in the buying and selling of commodities often have to have credit. They often don't have the money themselves, so they have to go to other people for the credit. And J.S. Morgan, the father, was one who established a financial house with offices in New York as well as in London. As a result of this, J.P. Morgan spent much of his time growing up in Europe. He received the finest education that money could buy. He was educated in some of the finest schools of Switzerland and the universities of Germany. He was a very apt mathematical student, in fact, at the University of Göttingen, one of the, the most prestigious universities focusing on mathematics in the entire world. Uh, it's said that uh, when he was uh, completing his course of study, one of his mathematics instructors, most impressed at his performance, offered him a position as an instructor at the university, but he said no, he was going to have to decline it because it was uh, necessary for him to go home and go into business, which he did. J.P. Morgan himself went into the commodity brokering business, got in just in time for the American Civil War, which was a terrific time to be in the business of buying and selling various commodities. The war drove up commodity prices uh, to historic levels, and anyone who was in the business of buying and selling could expect to make a great deal of money. Again, this reverts to a theme that I mentioned in the first lecture and I've referred to since, that is that war offers great opportunities. It usually disrupts received patterns of economic and business activity, uh, sometimes causing the destruction of old ways and putting older people out of business or people who've been in business longer out of business, uh, but often offering great opportunities for people who can take advantage of the new opportunities that emerge as a result of the war. Well, J.P. Morgan was in that situation, and as a result of the rising prices for commodities, as a result of the uh, emerging opportunities for people in the commodities business, he made himself quite wealthy. By 1864, he was making $50,000 a year. At that time, this was an exceedingly handsome income. Here I might just mention something. Many of the estimates of wealth during the 18th and 19th centuries are just that. They're only estimates. And the reason that they're only estimates is that no one was required to report wealth. I mentioned in an earlier lecture that uh, John Jacob Astor was perhaps the wealthiest man in America when he died in 1848. For the period of the Civil War, for the first time, we have some good records regarding incomes. And this was simply a matter of well, not exactly chance. It was a fortuitous result of the fact that during the Civil War, the U.S. Congress passed an income tax. And for the first time, people had to report their income. So we can know how much J.P. Morgan made his income. We don't know what his wealth was. Nobody had to report on his wealth. In fact, even today, people don't have to report their wealth to the IRS. They do have to report their income to the IRS. I guess this raises the question, was J.P. Morgan reporting all of his income? Well, that's a uh, difficult matter at any point. But anyhow, we can get a pretty good grasp on how much J.P. Morgan was making. He was making this money, by the way. This is, again, important thing to bear in mind regarding this ongoing theme about the interplay of business and government. Morgan and many other people who made a lot of money in the Civil War were making money on government contracts. This is going to be essential to the success of J.P. Morgan and essential to the development of American capitalism during the latter part of the 19th century. And it was perhaps never more in evidence than in the series of events that led to the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. It just so happened that J.P. Morgan had an important role in the American railroad business. So I need to say something about the Transcontinental Railroad and how it was built. In fact, Morgan wasn't closely involved in the construction of the original Transcontinental Railroad, but as we'll see, he comes into the picture here. The Transcontinental Railroad, you might say, completed the 19th century stage of the American transportation revolution, the revolution that began with steamboats, with canals, with steamships, ocean-going steamships, and finally with railroads. Well, the Transcontinental Railroad was the railroad taken to the natural conclusion or the logical extreme. Until the 1860s, railroads had been fairly local affairs. Even the Erie Railroad, the, the focus of the wars between Jay Gould and Cornelius Vanderbilt, was a railroad primarily that dealt with a stretch from New York City to the Great Lakes. 
but the great beyond, beyond into the Ohio Valley, beyond into the far west, this was really beyond the conception of the railroad builders of the time. And then that great accident of American history, the one that I referred to earlier, the discovery of gold in California, all of a sudden filled up California with people. And all those people in California who spent long months trying to get to California, either walking across North America or taking a ship around Cape Horn or the ones with the deepest pockets might ride in one of Cornelius Vanderbilt's steamships down to Nicaragua, cross Nicaragua, and then up the other side. They would take a month. All those people who took the great expense and the, the great amount of time to get to California dreamed of getting there faster, getting there less expensively. And the answer to their dream was a railroad. So from the 1850s, people began thinking of building a railroad across the United States. This, by the way, if it did occur, would have been the greatest industrial undertaking in American history to that point. The question was, how are we going to finance a transcontinental railroad? Until this point, all of the railroads had been financed through private money, typically the sale of shares of stock, or in some cases with minor subsidies from states. But the possibility of getting private money for a railroad to California seemed impossible. It was simply going to be too expensive and no private investors were willing to take the risks necessary to build such an industrial enterprise. As far as the states, well, this didn't work at all because there weren't any states on the other side of the Mississippi River. And so most of the railroad was going to be built in regions where there weren't states. The only solution to the problem was the federal government. However, the federal government hadn't been in the business of building railroads until this point, and most people thought the federal government should not be in the business of building railroads at this point. And there it would have stuck, except for something else that happened, and this was the Civil War. The Civil War, besides disrupting all sorts of patterns of business, created an opportunity for building the Transcontinental Railroad. It was something that no one really would have expected. It certainly wasn't central to the thinking of Abraham Lincoln or Robert E. Lee or anybody directly involved in the Civil War, but it worked something like this. During the 1850s, many people in California came from the American South. As a result, during the period leading up to secession in the beginning of the Civil War, there was strong talk in California of California seceding from the Union, not necessarily joining the Southern Confederacy, but becoming an independent country. Why independent? Because California was so far from the rest of the United States, and it took so long to get there. There were some Unionists within California, and the Unionists figured that one way of keeping California in the Union was to get the federal government to promise to build a railroad to California. When the federal government in the early 1860s decided to do that, all of a sudden the secessionist sentiment in California vanished at once. Well, of course, the condition was that California only gets its railroad if it stays in the Union. So in essence, California was bribed to stay in the Union. And what was the bribe? the promise of a transcontinental railroad. And how was the transcontinental railroad going to be funded? Primarily through public money. Again, getting back to this theme of the interplay between private business and the public government. The transcontinental railroad is funded by the federal government. The construction takes place during the 1860s. It ends in 1869. The transcontinental railroad is completed. This had a couple of very important effects for American business and for the American economy. Anybody who's interested in the industrial development of the country needs to pay attention to the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad for at least two reasons. In the first place, the mere construction of the railroad, and by the way, it was followed by four other transcontinental lines in the course of the next 20 years. The mere construction of the Transcontinental Railroad absorbed an enormous amount of the industrial output of the American economy so that the steel mills of Andrew Carnegie churned out tons and tons and tons of steel that were devoted to rails, devoted to the locomotives and all the rolling stock of railroads. So the railroads were simply huge consumers of America's industrial output. This was critical in causing the continued development of the American economy. But there was another function 
of the Transcontinental Railroad that was even more important. The Transcontinental Railroad, the first one in 1869 and subsequent ones in the course of the subsequent 20 years, created something that the world had never seen and that made American business more successful than businesses in any other country. And that is a single unified national market. The American market, the continental market that spanned from the Atlantic to the Pacific, that eventually encompassed the 48 lower states, was a market that was far larger than the market available to industrials, to manufacturers, to merchants in any other country. If you simply contrast the United States to Europe, Europe in the late 19th century was broken up into more than a dozen markets the markets corresponding to each of the separate countries. Why are they separate markets? Because the different governments have duties, tariffs, that block the import and exports of goods from one country to the next. And so a manufacturer in France, for example, who's building a steel mill, can make a steel mill only big enough to produce steel for the French market. The French market is very much smaller than the American market. The American market is continent-wide. The U.S. Constitution as interpreted in the Gibbons versus Ogden decision of 1824 that I mentioned in the lecture on Cornelius Vanderbilt, established the principle that the states could not bar commerce from one state to another. They couldn't put imports or other restrictions on commerce from one state to another. Essentially, it established the legal framework for this national market. The Transcontinental Railroad established the physical framework for this market. So the American economy now has this huge market in which to fill up. Um, Andrew Carnegie, for example, could build steel mills that could produce output for the whole country, not just for Pittsburgh or for that area. If one wants to know the secret of America's economic success, it wasn't that American inventors were smarter than the inventors in any other country. British inventors were at least as smart as American inventors. The secret of America's success was not that American resources were greater than the resources of any other country. Russia's resources were greater than the resources of the United States. The secret of America's success was this single unified national market. And that was the result of these two influences. One, the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court that says interstate commerce shall be free. And the second was the physical construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, which meant that physically speaking, transportation from one end of the country to the other shall be efficient and relatively low cost. Now enters... J.P. Morgan. The railroads were built during the 1860s, 1870s, and 1880s. But as is very often the case, they were overbuilt. One of the themes I mentioned in the introductory lecture was this phenomenon of booms and busts. There was a boom in real estate building in the 1860s, 1870s, and 1880s, with the result that everybody was building rail lines wherever they could. In some cases, with the assistance of the federal government, just like the first transcontinental line. In some cases, simply through private investment. But in any case, there was this notion that if we build a railroad, then all of a sudden businesses will crop up around the railroad and we'll all get rich. That was the basic idea. They carried the idea too far. This is what happens in every boom. There's this fundamentally good idea, but the idea gets carried too far. It got carried too far with the result that railroads were verging on bankruptcy in the 1880s and 1890s. Something needed to be done to prevent the bankruptcies because the railroads had become essential means of transport to communities all over the country. And the investors were losing their shirt. So the investors, the directors of the railroads, the public officials began looking to somebody to find someone who could bring some order out of this madness. And the man they turned to was Julius Pierpont Morgan, J.P. Morgan, who got into railroading as a result of having gotten into financing. He had already begun lending, investing, and he had invested in the railroad business. As a result, he was an important shareholder in some of these railroads. But the railroads often found themselves engaged in competition that was driving the various railroads out of business. A railroad that was trying to increase market share would sometimes build a rail line directly parallel to its competitor, with the result that there would be competing railroads right next to each other. Sometimes, as in the case of the Hudson Valley, there would be one railroad on one side of the river, another railroad on the other side of the river, serving the same markets. From the standpoint of the overall economy, in this case, there would be twice as much rail line laid as necessary. 
But neither side could get the other to refrain from engaging in this competition until they turned to J.P. Morgan. Morgan was very adept, first of all, at learning the intricacies of the railroad business. He was an astute student of business, of the rail business among us, of every other business they got involved in as well, but especially of the railroad business. So that very quickly he knew more about the railroad business than the directors of the railroad corporations themselves. So when he spoke about what was necessary to limit competition, to prevent this cutthroat competition and the, the rate wars, it was clear very early on that he knew whereof he spoke. He also commanded the confidence of investors. And this was absolutely critical because the railroads always needed new investment. And when Morgan said that he could bring investment into an industry, people believed him. There was one very famous moment when J.P. Morgan stepped in to a fight between the Pennsylvania Railroad and the New York Central Railroad. By this time, Morgan was already one of the wealthiest people in New York, and he lived in a very fashionable and high style of life. He had this uh, yacht that he used to sail around New York Harbor and called the Corsair. And uh, one day he invited the directors of the Penn, the Pennsylvania Railroad, and the New York Central to go for a ride on his yacht. And they went up the Hudson River as far as West Point. They turned around and came down the river as far as Sandy Hook. They turned around again. And meanwhile, Morgan was working on the various directors to come to an agreement to refrain from the kind of cutthroat competition they had been engaged in. And whether it was his charm whether it was his booze, whether it was a sense of of commitment or responsibility for having accepted Morgan's hospitality by the time the afternoon was over, in fact, it went far on into the evening, he managed to get a self-denying compact between the directors of the Penn and the New York Central. This was commonly called the Corsair Compact. It was an agreement to refrain from competition. Now, this is important to bear in mind. One of the themes that I've been developing here is changing notions of what's acceptable. In this day and age, in the 21st century, the idea of this kind of cooperation, we'd call it collusion, between two major competitors would be out of bounds. They'd all be prosecuted for antitrust activities, including Morgan. In those days, Morgan was seen as the savior of the industry. I should add, however, he wasn't seen as a savior by many of the people who rode on the trains, who shipped on the trains, because they realized that without this competition, they were going to pay higher rates. But from the standpoint of the industry, Morgan was indeed the man they were looking for. And over the course of the next 10 or 15 years, Morgan engaged in this kind of, call it uh, industrial diplomacy, bringing together leaders of competing railroads and other competing industries to get them to agree to cease the most bitter and the most destructive forms of their competition. Morgan had a mansion on Murray Hill in New York, and these meetings were called the Summits at Murray Hill. And the the railroad magnates would come, and they would all sit down, and they'd smoke Morgan's cigars and drink his liquor, and they would come to some sort of agreement that would prevent the kind of destructive competition. Now, again, this engendered great suspicion on the part of ratepayers, on the part of passengers, on the part of everybody else who felt that the captains of industry were colluding, as indeed they were, against the interests of the public, as indeed they were. Nonetheless, it wasn't illegal. It wasn't even considered particularly unethical. It was a bit impolitic. And so Morgan didn't advertise this sort of thing, but he recognized, at least he believed, that he was engaged in a necessary service, a necessary practice, because no one else could prevent what he saw as the self-destruction of the railroad system, which was absolutely necessary to the American economy. Morgan's power, his power as an industrial broker, as one who could command the confidence of investors became most apparent in 1895. Two years earlier, in 1893, there was another one of these regular panics, the Panic of 1893. It followed the same pattern as the Panic of 1837. There had been another panic in 1857, another panic in 1873. The Panic of 1893 triggered the worst depression in American history until that time. Unemployment was widespread and very deep. The economy was on the ropes. The U.S. Treasury felt the shock of all of this when gold in the U.S. Treasury began pouring out. In those days, the U.S. government guaranteed that its debts would be paid in gold. 
and people who had loaned money to the U.S. government in times of confidence were quite happy to accept the notes and the interest that they, they promised. But in times of distress, they wanted gold instead. Gold was flowing out of the U.S. Treasury at an alarming rate at the beginning of January 1895. President Grover Cleveland looked at the potential bankruptcy of the U.S. government. Imagine this, the U.S. government going bankrupt. It looked as though that was going to happen, that it would not be able to meet its obligations. Gold was flowing out at this very rapid and accelerating pace. Cleveland, who distrusted J.P. Morgan as much as most Democrats did, he was a Democratic president, uh, distrusted J.P. Morgan, but nonetheless felt obliged to call Morgan in and ask Morgan if he could stanch the bleeding, if he could do something to prevent the continuing outflow. And Morgan said that he could. Morgan said that he actually had already lined up European investors who were willing to sell gold to the U.S. government. Cleveland was a little bit worried. He didn't know that he had the authorization to purchase gold. He thought he'd have to go through Congress. Morgan, as always, knew more about this business than the people he was dealing with. And Morgan remembered that during the Civil War, Congress had passed a law allowing the U.S. government to sell coin, coin money, in exchange for gold. And he offered to sell gold to the U.S. government in exchange for the coin money. Cleveland, in fact, looked up the statute that Morgan referred to, and sure enough, there it was, right on the books. And Cleveland asked Morgan, if he could guarantee this, basically, if he could make sure that the U.S. Treasury wouldn't go bankrupt. And Morgan said, yes, he could. Cleveland was very mortified to have to go to this extreme, basically to put the U.S. Treasury, to put the U.S. government in the hands of J.P. Morgan, the sort of the arch financier in an age when certainly Democrats uh, but very many people distrusted financiers, but it was his only choice. Cleveland made the deal. Morgan guaranteed the liquidity of the U.S. Treasury, and he, he was able to pull it off. There was later a congressional investigation into this. People wanted to know how much Morgan had made on this, and he refused to tell them. He would say, he did say, up until the point when he sold the gold and got the, the notes from the U.S. government, that was all public business. But then once he got these obligations from the U.S. government, then he turned around and resold them at the profit. He wouldn't say. He said, that's my private business. It was a sign of the power of private enterprise, the power of private finance, that the president of the United States had to go hat in hand to J.P. Morgan. But it also demonstrated that at this particular moment, there was no one else who could do this. Now, J.P. Morgan lived several years longer. He lived almost long enough to see that the principle that there had to be some central financial control, some central financial reserve system for the country, come to fruition. In 1913, Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act, which created the Federal Reserve System that we have today. This essentially was another phase in the development of the relationship between private business and government, because in Morgan's day, Morgan acted, in essence, as a personal Federal Reserve System. It was Morgan that guaranteed the liquidity of the federal government. In 1913, Congress decided this can no longer be in the hands of a private individual. It has to be in the hands of an institution answerable to the public. And so we got the Federal Reserve System. And the Federal Reserve System has remained in operation until today. So that uh, there's nobody quite like J.P. Morgan in American finance today. But if there is anybody, it's the head of the Federal Reserve System. Next time, we're going to talk about a further transformation of the American economy and American business, in particular the rise of the automobile industry and the two individuals who exemplified the emergence of the automobile economy, Henry Ford and Alfred P. Sloan. After listening to Lecture 6, a student posed this question to Professor Brands. Why did these financial panics continually occur? Let's listen to the professor's response. The question of the recurrence of financial panics, as they were called during the 19th century, is one that has interested and vexed economic historians for a long time. They were something relatively new in American history. There hadn't been panics like this in the 18th century, for example. Uh, the main reason is that as the scale of the American economy increased, the weakness in a particular sector of the economy could spread into other areas of the economy. 
so that a financial panic in New York in 1817 or 1837 could easily spread to other parts of the economy as people lost confidence in banks and lost confidence in the ability to get their notes repaid. Until the economy reaches a certain stage of sophistication where there are networks of finance, it's not very subject to financial panics. If it's primarily an agricultural economy, then whether banks are doing well or not is of little concern to most farmers. Most farmers are going to grow their crops regardless. It's when industrial enterprises, when financial commercial enterprises depend on borrowed money, money that they have to pay back or that they have on deposit with banks. If the banks go under, then they're really stuck. So it's something that emerges as the American economy grows more sophisticated in the 19th century. It's a problem that remains with us today, although with the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913, the problem has, well, we'll cross our fingers. Since the Great Depression of the 1930s, the Federal Reserve has figured out how to manage the American economy so that if you look at the history of the United States, there have been panics about every 20 years, 1817, 37, 57, 73, 93. There are a couple of panics around 1910 or so. And then there was the Great Depression starting in 1929, continuing through the 1930s. But since then, again, knock on wood, we haven't had anything like that. Why is this? Well, apparently it's because there is this Federal Reserve System. There is this agency whose job is to manage the economy in the way that nobody was managing it during the 19th century.